Welcome to this uh, sold-out uh, performance uh, tonight, and I can all congratulate you on uh, uh, achieving a seat uh, at this uh, at this occasion. And I just will not comment on uh, the uh, what have been the, has been the attraction for you to come here, but clearly, you know, villains. Uh, call to uh, <laughs> everybody's uh, imagination. Good evening, I'm Robert Dijkraaf, I'm the director and Leon Levy professor here at the Institute for Advanced Study and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this Institute lecture which is a special one because it's coinciding with our semi-annual board meeting and so a particular warm welcome to all the uh, uh, members of the board of trustees uh, of the Institute at this occasion. And as always at the end of the lecture there will be a question and answer period which I think is uh, very, very uh, welcome for this particular topic. So I was very honored uh, today that our speaker is our newest faculty member, Jonathan Haslam. He's the George F. Cannon Professor in the School of Historical Studies and a leading scholar on the history of thought and international relations in the Soviet Union. He was appointed the 1st of July, uh, and he, before that he was a professor of the history of international relations at the University of Cambridge. But perhaps more important, he was actually a member here at the Institute in 1998. I also want to uh, uh, take this occasion to again uh, welcome his wife, Karina Ubach. Thank you for being here. Uh, Karina is a great scholar in her own right, a German-British culture and political relations in the 19th century, century, history of international relations and Jewish family history. And terrific to have you here too. As you know, uh, the Cannon Chair is a special chair. It was uh, established in 1998, 1995 to honor the diplomat, scholar, and institute faculty member George F. Cannon, uh, and was previously held by such disting distinguished scholars as Avishai Margalit, uh, Jose Coutillero, and Jack Matlock. Uh, the Cannon Chair is designed to bring to the institute outstanding scholars whose work bear on the understanding of the contemporary world. Well, that's definitely true for Jonathan Haslam, he made significant contributions to our understanding of contemporary phenomena uh, through critical and prescient examinations of the role of ideology. The studies of Soviet foreign policy are expensive in their range and quality and demonstrate his keen originality of thought. His work builds a bridge between historical studies and the understanding of contemporary phenomena through this critical examination of ideology. He's also kind of special in the sense he has been an advisor both to the British House of Lords and to the Russian Foreign Office. Author of many books, uh, I mentioned Soviet Foreign Policy, 1930-1933, The Soviet Union and the Politics of Nuclear Weapons, in Europe, The Soviet Union and the Threat from the East, and all these books offer expansive explorations and interpretation of Soviet international relations and foreign policies. Uh, his uh, book, Russia's Cold War, From the October Revolution to the Fall of the Wall, published in 2011, is actually the first comprehensive history of the Soviet Union's role in the Cold War, and based on this research on hitherto unexplored archival materials in various languages. Uh, Professor Haslam is not only working on the Soviet Union, he has also studied American foreign policy, for instance, in the book, The Nixon Administration, The Death of Allende's Chile, a case of assisted suicide. He conducted extensive archival research to investigate the role of US policy uh, under President Nixon in undermining Salvador Allende's government. Most recently, he authored a book, Near and Distant Neighbors, New History of Soviet Intelligence, which was published this year. And uh, it charts the labyrinth story of Soviet intelligence, again, from the October Revolution to the end of the Cold War. And the Institute has partnered with the local bookstore, Labyrinth Books, to make signed copies uh, available after the event. Jonathan earned a Bachelor of Science in Economics in the London School of Economics, a Master's from Trinity College Cambridge and a PhD from Birmingham. He had various positions at Cambridge. Uh, he also had visiting positions at Berkeley, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Stanford and Yale, and as I said, also here at the Institute. Now, today's lectures has the title, Do We Understand Putin's Russia? And you will see it ends with a question mark. Now, you all probably know Betteridge Law of Headlines, which is an old adage that said any headline that ends in a question mark can be answered by the word no. <laughs> uh, it's named after Ian Betteridge, uh, uh, Wikipedia tells me, a British technology journalist, although the principle is much older and you can find various websites dedicated to this. But actually, I found that there was some research that, in fact, not all questions are yes and no. There's only a minority that we can answer it. 
And then maybe, many questions has maybe, and research shows that of the remaining 37% of cases, in 17% the answer is no, but in 20% the answer is yes. So, uh, so this is the, the, the most I can say in terms of predicting what the uh, answer of, uh, if any, of uh, this question is. But I hope you uh, all uh, join me not only in welcoming Jonathan Haslam to the stage, but also to the Institute and the Princeton community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I feel I lack the scientific ability to have worked out uh, my title in this manner. Um, do, we un do we understand Putin's Russia? Um, I would say certainly we have problems understanding Putin's Russia. And I th there are various reasons for this. And most of them, I think, are in fact cultural uh, as well as historical. And uh, I'm, if I'm talking to uh, an audience of social scientists or political scientists, I would say you should have read history to understand these things. Um, but this audience gathers together much more knowledge than I could have ever hoped for. So I would say um, the problem with the administration, the current administration in the United States, was that it set out in its foreign policy to do as it would be done by. That's to say, it, it began in the first term on the premise that if you treated Russia in a certain way, you would get certain responses. And, you know, that's a rational way of handling people. But it sort of assumes that what went on before you came to power did not really fundamentally affect the people you're dealing with. And this is where we get into the interactivity of international relations, which makes a so an assumption of rationality uh, a rather tricky one. So on the one hand, President Obama and uh, Secretary Kerry more recently um, assumed that somehow deals could be done more easily. On the other hand, we had a statement from the Republican side from Condoleezza Rice recently, and she said, stop saying that we want to better understand Russian motives. In other words, don't try. Um, there we could go into a question of what she meant by this. That's to say um, they don't matter to the United States or that um, we already understand them as they are. But she didn't quite go on to tell us which one it was. I'll fill in that gap for you. Um, uh, now, there are three problems, I think, um, trying to understand Putin's Russia. Or at least I've met three problems one of which is understanding the culture and traditions from which Putin's Russia emerges. It does not emerge on a blank sheet. It emerges with a quite horrendous past, um, uh, times imposed from outside in times self-imposed. And of course, the hopes emerged at the end of the Soviet Union and in fact with Gorbachev before the very end that somehow this past could be overcome. And I think there was a tendency, certainly from the United States, to put all hopes on those who replaced Gorbachev. But of course, you come to power in a massive country. Um, there are people, according to friends of mine who are anthropologists and who am I to contradict them, way out across the Urals in Siberia, who certainly in the 1960s and 70s hadn't heard about the October Revolution yet. So it's quite possible in a place like Russia, you're, you're, you're pulling the past with you. And I remember in my frequent visits to the Soviet Union, all those little old ladies in black, they used to be no more than five feet tall, and you thought, they seem to be everywhere, but they're perfectly harmless. No, they weren't. They regarded the country as theirs. They had suffered in war and famine and then war again and then semi-starvation at the end of World War II. They regarded that country as theirs. And these attitudes from the past could still be felt, seen, and heard from the elderly. Now, that generation have died out, but these things live on. And then I'll add a, a further complication so in other words, do not assume that Russians are happy Americans. 
or even unhappy Americans. <laughs> um, the second point is the loss of empire, which I've emphasized in the introduction um, on, on the circulation list. I think it's difficult for Americans to see it, but for Europeans, uh, certainly in Western Europe, this is a real thing. For the Dutch, for the British, for the French, the loss of empire had a sort of semi-traumatic effect, not just an economic effect. And it led, certainly in the case of the British and the French, to feelings of revenge. Um, de Gaulle, in a sense, epitomized it in some form, and if you like, one reading of the Falklands War, Las Malvinas, um, was that this was the final act of revenge for the loss of empire. Had Galtieri not done it, this, this wouldn't have aired itself. But I remember in Britain at the time feeling I was in a very strange and different country when that war broke out and all the flags went up and I started to think, am I old enough to be conscripted or am I young enough to be conscripted? Am I old enough to get out of this? But anyway, we won, so it didn't matter. Um, well, it matters now. But, um, but the loss of empire in Russia mattered more because that empire was, the Soviet Union, was, was an extension of the old Russian empire. In this sense, Russia had never been a state. It was always an empire. It had to become a state. It had to reinvent itself as a state. And the empire was contiguous with Russian territory. So whereas the British could say, well, you know, the next following generations, you know, so where was northern Rhodesia or southern Rhodesia? Show me on the map. Well, they've all been renamed, so you would have to show them on the map. But with Russia, I mean, they're next door, and the people who live next door became intermingled with Russians. So you didn't have a clear ethnographic cutoff between Russia and the successor states of the Soviet Union. This is a big problem. They call the, the Russians abroad. And the countries surrounding, which are nominally independent from Russia, are called the near abroad. So you start to see even the, the concepts, the way of talking about successor states raises severe problems. And then you put on top of that Mr. Putin, Vladimir Putin, who should be taken very seriously. And the Western press, certainly the gutter press in Britain, has a habit of portraying him in this. They pick out the strangest photographs of him on the campaign trail. It's rather like taking George Bush Sr. when I remember he was driving some huge truck uh, in Kansas seeking votes, wearing one of these um, baseball caps. I mean, it's not exactly typical George Bush. And, and Vladimir Putin sitting on a horse uh, having lost his shirt is not exactly a typical representation of Mr. Putin. But Mr. Putin is not just a former KGB officer who spent his time in Leipzig and part of East Germany uh, doing goodness only knows what. He was essentially counterintelligence. But he represents a group of people. He is not just one man. If he fell tomorrow, um, another would take his place. There's no problem with that. In fact, his uh, chief of staff is viewed as a likely successor, and his chief of staff came from the KGB. And the defense minister, who unfortunately we've lost his head here, Mr. Shoigu, also comes from this sort of background. The military are intermingled uh, in, in their mentality, the diehards, with uh, former KGB people. So you've got a, comp a very, very complex mix. And as you can see, for any decision maker in the West, to make facile assumptions about how they would behave, because no president, no secretary of state, nobody on the National Security Council has ever spent time with someone like this from this culture. So it's not to be surprised at that we make mistakes in dealing with these people. Mistakes were made with his predecessors, and mistakes will doubtless be made with his successors. Now, to just to typify Putin's attitudes, um, he's, he's wonderful in interviews because he's rather like George Bush II, who scorns um, idiot journalists if he thinks they're idiots and just speaks his mind. So he's a, a great quote. Um, 
In answer to the question, how has the KGB influenced you as a statesman, Mr. Putin says, whatever we do, all the knowledge, the experience, they stay with us. We sustain them and make use of them one way or the other. <laughs> so there's no renunciation of the old uh, order. And then there's a, there was a scary quote most recently. Nothing that happens in the skies or on the earth is spontaneous. That might appeal to scientists, but it gives me a horrid, <laughs> chilling feeling up the spine. This Stalin, when he um, met uh, Avril Harriman, when Harriman was ambassador in Moscow and, and he came to discuss the war in the Pacific at the end of 44, um, at one moment in the conversation, the phone rang or something or other, Stalin picked it up, heard something, put it down, and he turned to Harriman and he said, you know, there was a railway crash in Ukraine yesterday. It wouldn't have been an accident. And, and you start thinking, oh, what's happening to all the railway people? Um, and this is very much a state of mind which for, for any Western negotiator is going to be difficult to deal with. It's an uphill task. Now, when Putin took power, I'm not going to go into too much history because you don't have three hours to spare, but when Putin took power um, effectively in 1999 and went to the country, he, he, there was a long, long radio phone-in that went on for hours and it was printed out in the pages of Pravda, I think it was, and he made no electoral promises whatsoever except one. And the only electoral promise he made was to restore the borders of the former Soviet Union. That was the only promise. That promise has stuck with him. Now, what politicians say to get re-elected is one thing, as we all know, and what they do when they're in power is another. But we have to register that. He came to power with a strategy, which is most unusual for these Russian leaders. His strategy was to accept the fact the Soviet Union was no longer a military superpower, that it would have to find its leverage in international relations elsewhere, and that it would use the immense abundant resources of Russia as leverage in international relations, in trade and investment. And those abundant resources were, above all, oil and gas. Now, he said this um, in 19... Well, he, he created this model actually before he took power. In about 1997, he did a thesis, some of which was borrowed from certain people, but he wrote a thesis on this at the Plekhanov Institute in, in Leningrad, St. Petersburg, today. And um, the strategy was essentially pivoted on one assumption, which in 1997 to 8 was a very risky assumption, um, the price of oil and gas. And in 1998, it was $9 a barrel oil, oil and gas shadowing it. And only Jim Rogers, I think, had worked out that actually in about 10 years' time, it would be more than triple, quadruple that, and then invest in it. So if, if Putin had been a commodity man, he would have made an absolute fortune, uh, an, another fortune that Jim Rogers made um, at the time. But it, it worked. He was right. And during the course of time, oil peaked at $120 a barrel in 2012. Now, this was irrelevant to relations with the United States. But it was critical in relations with Europe. And during this period of time, control over gas in particular, natural gas in particular, gave Putin enormous influence over Europe, particularly over Germany, which leads Europe, particularly over Gerhard Schroeder, who managed to, how shall I put it, co-invest in such projects before he left the chancellorship. And, and in effect, what Putin successfully did was neutralize the European part of NATO as far as any effective uh, political and military matters were concerned, but not the United States. Putin hoped that by, as it were, stepping down as a, a recognizing the realities 
of Russia no longer being a superpower, the United States would come to terms with the new Russia and, and work with him. This was the initial assumption. And when 9-11 um, happened and the Twin Towers in New York came crumbling down, Putin had a meeting with his defense council and had a long argument with them. He said, Russia needs to open its books on intelligence with the United States. And they all said, no, you can't do that. We don't share intelligence with anybody. And we certainly don't share it with the United States. And Putin wasn't long in power. But he managed to override objections and open material for the US services about Al-Qaeda and these operations in um, Asia. Putin expected to get something out of this. So the information was passed over and nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. Intelligence cooperation systems were set up. Justice Department representative in Moscow was to liaise with the Russians, etc. But nothing really happened because from that moment of 9-11 onwards, the Bush administration was planning for the destruction of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And Saddam Hussein was one of the traditional allies of the Soviet Union and was regarded by Russian Arabists as a continuing ally in the Middle East, just as a certain leader in Syria was so regarded. And then... The United States, with Britain following suit, went to war with Iraq in 2003. Again, not only uh, without prior consultation with the Russians, but against Russian wishes, as against German wishes and French wishes. And this was regarded by the Russians as a complete slap in the face. So relations did not begin. This is the further complication to an existing... Um, precondition of complication of relations was the way the Bush administration treated Russia. And it took quite a, what Condoleezza Rice would regard as an entirely rational view. Well, the Russians are no longer a superpower. We are a superpower. We're the only superpower. You know, where's Russia today? Their economy is bad. They're trying to sort themselves out. They've lost an empire. Why should we treat them any more differently than France or some other such countries? So effectively, that's what the Bush administration did at a cost. And what the Iraq war showed Russia was that war is an acceptable continuation of policy by other means in the contemporary world. So the strategy of the double strategy, there was a strategy of using oil and gas to neutralize Europe, then there was, the there was a strategy that had to be developed in some ways to regain positions lost on the periphery of Russia. And they chose Georgia because there were uprisings, unrest in parts of Georgia that had only loosely identified with the regime in Tbilisi, and the man who led Georgia for a long time, Gorbachev's right-hand man, Shevardnadze, had, according to the Russian military, sold out Eastern Europe and given up on the Russian Empire in Eastern Europe. So there were scores to be settled with Georgia, and special forces went in over a period up to 2008. Um, and then eventually the Georgians reacted brought in some American moral support um, from Bruce Jackson and others, and then the Russians retaliated and clobbered them. And this was regarded as a sort of a moment of exquisite recovery of empire with Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The Russians don't really need all this territory, but it was regarded as settling a profound score in a manner that, well, everybody else was doing it, weren't they? The, the impact, the longer-term impact of um, NATO saving um, the remnants of Yugoslavia from Serbian force of arms also resonated in Russian arms, because back in the 90s, what had Russia done to save the fellow Serbs from the West? Nothing. 
This time, the Russians wouldn't allow a recurrence of that. So it, feed, it fed into this feeling of the need of some sort for revenge. Now, when you take it against this background, the events in Georgia, which began with the use of special forces and then led to the use of conventional forces, you see the same thing replay in Ukraine. These little green men who appeared in, in the Crimea just over a year ago in the early spring, they appeared in the Crimea, not a large number of them, Putin was sort of putting his feet into the water because when the little green men appeared, it was announced that these must just be unofficial um, locals who had got dressed up in paramilitary uniforms and were doing things. Moscow actually declared that it had nothing to do with this at all. When asked if they had forces there, they said, no, no, we absolutely have none. At this point, if you were um, on the alert in Moscow, you'd say, let's see if the Americans go in and take them out. There weren't that many. They could have just been bundled up and put on a boat somewhere to North Africa. They didn't have to be shot to pieces if you outnumbered them. But nothing happened. So the little green men gradually became bigger green men and more green men, and then they took over the Crimean Peninsula. And I remember at the time, our former ambassador to Moscow, who was a good chap, but suffered in Moscow, was on the BBC immediately when they asked him, well, are the Russians going to annex Crimea and take it? Oh, no, no, they'd never do that sort of thing. Not in this sort of world. Secretary of State Kerry more or less said the same thing. And then bit by bit, the Russians took Crimea. And the next step was to send little green men, well, larger green men, into eastern Ukraine, which had its problems because Ukraine was a basket case. Its, its level of corruption on the International Corruption Index is, you know, out of sight from the Western world. So there are all sorts of underlying problems and the problems with native Russians or those of Russian extraction versus those Ukrainian extraction. So there were underlying problems. But this was a resolution of these problems by the introduction of secret service techniques. And these techniques used in Crimea, used in Georgia, and used in eastern Ukraine, separate from Crimea, were techniques used quite a lot in the 1920s against Poland, against Pilsudski's Poland. They were techniques well established in the security services. So you start to see it makes a difference, a real difference, having as head of head of state and effectively head of government, someone who is psychologically tied into a tradition of practices. The other was, of course, the assassination of Mr. Litvinenko in London. And this was a ghastly affair of trails of polonium uh, across. I never heard of polonium before. I don't think most people had across London. This man was poisoned in the most horrendous way. And we cannot say who was finally responsible for the death of Mr. Litvinenko, but those the uh, police in London deem responsible, those carrying the polonium around, uh, cannot be extradited from Moscow. And one of them is now in the legislature, which gives him complete immunity. And the Russian state refuses to allow movement. Now, to assassinate somebody on foreign soil um, in these days is really quite an extraordinary thing to do. Stalin used to do it in the very, very bad old days. Khrushchev made a habit of it in the 1950s with the um, Stefan Bandera and others, the emigres working in Germany. But mostly, um, this was not a practice uh, normally pursued. But somehow the atmosphere created in Moscow was such that they were getting revenge on a foreign en uh, on an internal enemy who was abroad. This was the criteria used by Khrushchev in the 1950s and reused. And what Putin did that made this possible ultimately was to give counterintelligence at home a role abroad 
in foreign intelligence. So these people who were accused of doing this were accused as members of the FSB, of counterintelligence, not foreign intelligence. These complications with London, however, never somehow affected relations with the EU. In other words, oil and gas still mattered fundamentally. And for the United States, this didn't happen on American soil. So London was effectively isolated. What were the British going to do? Nothing affected. A lot of diplomatic, uh, well, offensive diplomatic talk, but nothing really very much. Now, in this time, Putin had a window for developing the Russian economy and restructuring it up to the time of the beginning of the fall of the oil price. So the oil price peaks in 2012, I think around $120 a barrel, and now it's heading south from $45 a barrel. In that period, the Russians saved a lot of foreign exchange of their earnings. But during the subsequent period, they've spent almost all of the savings. One more year of subsidizing Russian banks because they, they are indebted abroad and those savings will run dry. And what are the restructuring of the Russian economy? The restructuring that began under Yeltsin in the mid-90s was an incredibly corrupt affair. The best thing to do was to be married to somebody who had worked with somebody who had worked with Yeltsin and particularly of a member of his family, in which case you had no, no worries about tomorrow. This was an incredibly corrupt marketization of the Russian economy in the mid-90s, which spawned all these people you've heard about, these so-called oligarchs. These men who were usually at an institute for mathematics at the Academy of Sciences, there was an opportunity in the late 80s and early 90s, and the sharpest of them became multi-billionaires. And some of this money was funneled to some of these people by the KGB and by the party, sort of, hang on, you take this out before the other people come, but we'll get in touch later. Well, when they got in touch <laughs> with them later, in the late 90s, they said, moi? I'm not sure who you're talking to. <laughs> I took money from you. No, I made all this myself. I'm a multi-billionaire by ability. But in fact, this money was to be looked after and developed. But um, they reckon stolen by some of these people. And what Putin did, these people were a natural source of support because they were tied into that regime. They, they could lose everything if they didn't play it right. And Putin needed financial support. And Berezovsky, the one who committed suicide a year ago, was one of his main supporters. And Ber but Berezovsky assumed that if you paid your politician properly, your politician would follow through and do what you wanted. And it was at that point he separated from Putin. And Litvinenko was a creature of Berezovsky within counterintelligence. He took upon himself a proposal to wipe out criminals who were aiming at dispossessing Berezovsky and in fact assassinating him. So he stuck himself in that position and ultimately paid for it with his life. Putin basically destroyed the oligarchs. There are one or two left, one who owns Chelsea Football Club in London. There are a couple of Oleg Deripaska and others but basically, as a species, they're in major decline. And, but the, at a cost. The cost was no separate sources of power could exist in Russia. This money made possible different political groupings, different political parties. They may have been partly corrupted, but there were jokes when I did American economic history that the only thing... What was it that um, uh, that um, the um, uh, petroleum company in New Jersey uh, didn't do uh, to the legislature was refine it? 
And, and so, so we shouldn't be too judgmental about the Russia of the 90s when Britain of the 18th century and America of the 19th century and early 20th had similar features. But the point was he wiped out sources of opposition, pluralist power, and at the same time wiped out the growth of the market, a more pluralist market in the economy. The two sort of went together. And then this had its impact on foreign investment because if you start to do that, uh, what's happening to the market? The market's not a real market. Do you want to invest in it? And a lot of Russians then took money out of the market. Mostly it's to be found in Cyprus, but also in Switzerland, the United States, and all over the globe. Then they brought their wives and mistresses out. Then their daughters and sons started going to British public schools and American universities. And you're suddenly, you know, um, it, somebody called it the Dutch disease, but I don't understand that particularly. But the, the leeching of talent out of Russia consequent upon these persecutions. And human rights in Russia are not respected. Journalists disappear. All sorts of people disappear in Russia. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the United States, Britain, and others can't have proper diplomatic relations with a country like this. China has horrendous things happening within it, and somehow relations are possible. But it depends really upon how the uh, Russian leadership operates vis-a-vis -vis these countries. Um, so the, essentially what Putin did was he came to power with an overall view, reconstitute borders of the Soviet Union. He came to power with a strategy to do it, which relied on the commodity markets, which have now gone south. What alternatives are left? He has decided to bank now on military power. And the Russians spend about $70 billion a year on military-related expenditure. The United States spends seven times that amount but the Russians are still number two in the world. But spending 70 billion that comes out of current investment, it has to come out from somewhere, it doesn't come out of savings, is an enormous drain on the economy. Putin has argued uh, from age-old arguments that somehow this will jumpstart the economy technologically. But as most people know, most military technologies are actually a drag they are, they are a product of prior um, technological advances. They don't actually create technological advances. So he's walking blindly in this direction. He has now increased the military budget by another 15% on last year. So they're increasing these things. And at the same time, Western sanctions imposed upon them, Western economic sanctions, are impinging enormously on Russia because they have a banking system which is something you don't want to be close to. And, and that banking system needs thorough reorganization and recapitalization. But those banks which have large foreign debts cannot borrow abroad in foreign markets because of the sanctions imposed by NATO. As a result, there's a scissors coming into existence. Putin's short-term solution is therefore to devalue the ruble. Uh, and it's basically been floating downwards. Now, this has met with enormous opposition. And it's not true to say in Russia today that you can't have opposition to Putin. Some writers, some, one biographer of his, uh, makes extraordinarily insulting remarks about Putin, or that Putin would remark, view as insulting, um, and others, even some major commentators in newspapers over which he normally would have some sort of control, have openly said Putin's economic policy is a disaster. We have to do something about it. On top of this, he makes the decision, or they make the decision in August, to go into Syria. Now, you could say, well, it makes sense, it's nearby, it's what they call, the Russians call the Near East rather than the, the Middle East. The Near East, um, they don't want the advance of militant ex Islam upwards into um, the Russian space, 
They worried about Afghanistan, post-Afghanistan. They worried about Iran. They, wor they, they fought the Chechens to keep their influence down in the south, and they had every reason to worry about militant Islam in the Near East. But the decision to go in and bomb the so-called Islamic State in Syria, they've flown over 195 sorties in three weeks. Um, now, most of the, the, the uh, tonnage landed, of course, on, Sad, uh, on the opponents of the Assad regime, regardless of whether they were Islamic State or not. Um, the whole area around Aleppo, which was the um, Free Syrian Army, has been bombed to pieces by um, the Russians and sent over 26 cruise missiles in to hit command and control headquarters and hopefully declare victory for Assad. But this air war was presupposed to be followed through with a ground war fought by Assad. But aside from taking a few villages, Assad's armies are incapable of doing this. And a huge amount of discontent has arisen, even within the Russian armed forces, over this idea of going to Syria. You know, days before the decision, just a few days after the decision was made at the end of September, in major newspapers in Russia, military commentators were saying, are we going into a new Afghanistan? And that's a serious worry, because if Assad doesn't follow through, you're not going to win this just by bombing from the air. So what do you do next? And there are Russian special forces in Syria, because you can't have major naval bases there, which they have, uh, without having some form of ground forces to protect them. So the worry of many Russians is they're going to get into another war. Now, the United States is scheduled to get out of Afghanistan, and I know that schedule is sort of gets set back. But effectively, the Americans are, are gradually letting go of Afghanistan. And although some of the Afghan forces have defeated um, the Taliban in northern Afghanistan, they've given the Russians a fright. The Russians reckon about 60% of the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan is controlled by the Taliban. In other words, this war, this Islamic war, could come up through the south, through Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. How are the Russians going to deal with that? So although Putin moved on Ukraine, mostly, well, he wanted to uh, follow through on his promises of 1999 to win electoral support in Russia, because these were popular moves amongst many Russians, they didn't cost much, they have become unstuck. And the first sign that they'd seriously come unstuck with the body count in eastern Ukraine was when um, his regime only two months ago banned any dissemination of knowledge of who had died in eastern Ukraine or Crimea. You can no longer mention it. Prior to that, there was this marvelous organization called the Soldier Mothers of Russia, um, this organization which took communications and letters and complaints from Russian mothers about the disappearance of their sons and husbands, and they would take it up to the high command and demand to know where they'd gone, what had happened, how they disappeared. Now, that's probably still going on because these women are protected by the high command. But nothing of this has been publicized for the last two months. So we have two pictures of Mr. Putin here, one of which looking very statesmanlike with the defense people. Um, the other one, you could argue, is he going down or is he coming up? <laughs> because if this continues, he he will not be able to stay in power as he is now. There will be severe trouble. And whether it's severe trouble from people like himself, in other words, another set of bad people, or something else, we don't know. 
Now, um, when I ask the question whether we really understand Putin's Russia, if you look at the behavior of the United States and Britain, you could argue that we actually don't understand them. We don't understand them enough because policy has been very hesitant, policy has been inconsistent, uh, certainly under the present regime. But you can see some element of rationality to it in looking at the Russian economy and the projections of the Russian economy, the argument made is, hang in there, it's a matter of time before the economy pinches on the behavior of Mr. Putin and his friends. In other words, on the, in the long term, this, uh, the more objectionable signs of Russian behavior will have to end, and at some time, Russia will have to come to terms on Ukraine. The question, of course, with the countries involved is, it's never soon enough. But this is the rationale, and that's why Obama's in, in, initial reaction on advice when the Russians went into Syria was, hang on here, this isn't a sign of strength, it's a sign of weakness. I'm not sure it's a sign of weakness, I think it's a sign of panic and desperation. And there is a truth to the argument made in Russia that if you don't stop the fundamentalists where they are, they'll be on your doorstep next. And in Russia, you can work up a sense of paranoia about the South, as they call it, that you couldn't do in many other places of the world. So I would argue that there is some understanding of Russia. Um, the points at which we understood that we didn't follow through on that understanding, namely, when Yeltsin was in power and when George Bush was in power, we're living with the consequences of lack of understanding. The curious thing is today, now that the United States has committed special forces, apparently only 50, um, into Syria, um, the United States has announced, or at least one of its representatives has announced, that U.S. intelligence is now going to refocus itself from third world trouble spots to Russia. And I'm thinking, what's that going to tell us in addition to what we already know? But it's clearly a consequence of the fact that the White House was taken by surprise both in the Crimea and in regard to Syria that the rationale as to explanation as to why the Russians have gone in and for what purpose has been inadequate. Uh, I can go to questions now. <laughs>